you and I are going to have a conversation about the most important relationship that you have in life, and that's the relationship you have with yourself. I am going to introduce you to a habit that I want you to practice immediately. It is a habit that is based on profound research, and it is a habit that will help you improve the relationship you have with yourself. It will impact your happiness, your sense of control, your confidence. This is the Mac Daddy of all habits. You master this habit, you improve the relationship you have with yourself, and this is like the first domino. You know how in dominoes, when you line them up, there's that one domino that, boom, you knock that sucker over and woohoo, I can't even remember. All the other dominoes fall. So we are talking about the gateway to creating a positive ripple effect in your life and improving the relationship with yourself. And also, it is the secret, this habit, to self-acceptance and self-love. We know we should love ourselves. We should be kind to ourselves. We should accept ourselves. But nobody knows how to do it. And that's what this entire episode is about. I am going to boil the how down to one extraordinarily simple habit backed by a crazy amount of research that we will link to and my own research study involving 175,000 people from 91 countries who tried this habit for five days in a row. So that means we've got data points that stack up to 175,000 times five. I don't even know what that number is, but it's pretty big. This works. It's high-fiving yourself every morning in the mirror as part of your morning routine. That's it. And I've got the research to prove it. I've got studies to prove it. And what we have found based on our research is that it takes less than five days for you to have an absolutely profound breakthrough in your relationship to yourself by simply adding a high five in the mirror once a morning to your morning routine after you brush your teeth. And at the end of this episode, I want you to stick around because you are going to hear one of the most profound testimonials ever about the impact that one high five made on a woman's life named Chris. Like you're going to need to bring the Kleenex because this is so goosebump, empowering and encouraging and exciting. I'm not kidding. This is profound, profound, profound. And I know that you struggle with self-love because none of us know how to do it. I get questions on this every single freaking day. How do I love myself? I know I need to love myself, Mel, like this one from Maria. Hi, Mel. This is Maria from Spain. Can you explain how to learn to love yourself? I know I need to love myself as a part of my self-growth, but no one tells you how to do that. I'm curious, is there something I can do about that? I love this question because she's right. We all know we need to love ourselves, but how the hell do you do that? when nobody has taught you how. I think the main reason why this concept of self-love is so hard to implement in our lives is because of the definition of love. If you look in the dictionary, love is defined as a feeling, but that's not what it is. Love is an action. And let's just take an example from your life. When you feel loved by somebody else, it's because of how they treat you. It's because of what they say to you. Like for example, when Chris brings me a cup of coffee in the morning, I feel loved because of that action. When he says, I love you, Mel, I feel loved because of the action of speaking those words. But when it comes to loving ourselves, we're sitting around waiting for the feeling, and yet we're not recognizing the truth about love. You feel loved by other people when they demonstrate it through actions. The secret to self-love is demonstrating to yourself through your own actions toward yourself that you love yourself. And that's why the simple solution to having a breakthrough in loving yourself, the first domino that needs to fall, is something that I call the high five habit. This is a simple habit that I created that boiled down is simply adding a high five in the mirror to yourself, to your morning routine. That's what the high five habit is. Now, one of the reasons why I love this habit is because it has so much research. And the habit's very simple. When you wake up tomorrow morning, 
get yourself out of bed, go into the bathroom, brush your teeth, and then after you brush your teeth, you're going to put your toothbrush down. And the reason why I want you to do it after you brush your teeth is because I want to use some science called habit stacking. I want this to be part of your morning routine, what you're about to do. And so I want you to do it right after something that you do every morning, brushing your teeth. That way your brain will encode this high five habit even faster. And here comes the most important part. As you put the toothbrush down, you are going to look in the mirror. This is the hardest part of the high five habit. You're going to look in the mirror and I don't want you to look through the person in the mirror. I want you to realize there's a human being that's standing in the mirror there with you every morning in the bathroom and you have either ignored them or you have looked at all of the things you don't like about that person, whether it's the weight that you've put on or it's the bags under your eyes or for me, it's one boob hanging lower than the other boob. You sit there and judge that person or based on our research and studies, 50% of men and women cannot or will not look at themselves in the mirror. And the reason is so freaking sad. It's because they don't like the person they've become or they have so many regrets in life uh, about things that they did or the place that they thought that they would be that they can't and won't look at themselves in the mirror. And if you can't look at yourself in the mirror, let's just stop at that right there because what do you do with somebody you love? What's the action when you see somebody you love? You look them in the eyes. That gaze eye to eye gives you a, a, a not only dopamine, but the oxytocin that is in your brain. It is powerful. It's an act of love to really make eye contact and hold a gaze with love and compassion behind it. So if you can't do that and you're not doing that, you're every morning demonstrating, not love, you're demonstrating rejection and criticism. And so first step of the high five habit, you are going to put your toothbrush down and you're going to look at yourself in the eye. And it's going to feel weird if you don't normally do this. And the next part of this is very simple. Whenever you feel ready, you're going to raise your hand and you're going to high five the person you see in the mirror. Now, one of two things will happen when you do this. And again, I have so much data on this. I know because we've studied what happens. What's going to happen when you go to high five the mirror is you will either laugh out loud and you'll laugh out loud because it's kind of dorky and funny. That's the first, that's what I did the first time I, I high five myself in the mirror. But you're also laughing because your brain recognizes a high five. And so one of the coolest things about high-fiving yourself in the mirror is the science involved. It's called neurobics. You're using research in a field called neurobics, which is when you marry a physical action with a new positive thought you want to create. They've studied this at MIT. They've studied it all over the world. It is the fastest way to create new neuropathways and new thought patterns, to marry physical action like a high-five with a new thought. And here's where the high five in the mirror gets really cool. So you're leveraging neurobics, all of this sort of physical activity plus neuroscience. You're also getting the benefit of the release of dopamine. You're also getting the benefit of the fact that your brain and your body knows what a high five is because you've been high fiving people your whole life, right? You've seen high fives in sports on television. You know exactly what a high five is. A high five is something that you give somebody a physical action when you're cheering for them, when you're encouraging them. A high five is something that you give to somebody when you're proud of them. Great shot. Good job on that test. And a high five is also something that you give to another human being whenever they need encouragement. So think about like standing on the side of a road race. You don't cross your arms and scowl at people. You high five people and cheer for them because you're trying to say, I see you. I see that this race is hard. Keep going. You got this. If you're on a sports team and you blow a play when you come to the huddle, a high five from a coach or a teammate says, shake it off. I believe in you. Now get back in the game. And so what's so cool about this high five habit to yourself in the mirror is that a lifetime of positive programming neurologically already in your brain gets aimed right back at your reflection. 
And so you are physically demonstrating with this simple habit in less than five seconds every single morning that you, yes, you, you take actions that show that you believe in, you love, and you encourage the person in the mirror. Now, another reason why I love this habit is you don't have to think anything. All of the wiring that is already in your brain and in your nervous system, it does the work for you silently. As I mentioned, there is so much research, and we're going to just put just dozens and dozens and dozens of studies, but I want to also point out that there are two studies that are really important. Um, one of them was done with the MBA, and I'm just going to cut to the chase on this study. They wanted to know if there were any habits that winning teams had that the losing teams in the NBA didn't have in the preseason. And it turned out after crunching all the data, and this has been verified by the Wall Street Journal too, beyond the study that these scientists did, that the top four teams in the NBA, in fact, do have a habit in the preseason that the losing teams do not. And you want to know what that habit is? You guessed it. They have more high fives, fist bumps, pats on the back in the preseason among team members than any of the other teams. Why? Well, because a high five isn't just an action and a physical gesture that means nothing. A high five actually says, I am with you. It builds trust. It builds partnership. It builds belief. And you can build that back in yourself by adding the high five in the mirror every single morning um, as part of your morning routine. There was another study done with kids where they made a bunch of kids take these math tests and these researchers wanted to know what's the best way to encourage someone through a challenging moment. And they found that it wasn't words of encouragement, like, hey, you're a great student. It wasn't the growth mindset words, like, hey, really admire how hard you're working. You want to know the single best way to motivate kids to do something challenging? It's to say nothing and to give them a high five. This was so profound that the researchers, and we'll link to this study, changed the name of the study to include the surprising power of a high five, the surprising motivational power of a high five. That's how exciting this is. And I think you can hear this because I stumbled onto this by mistake. I started high-fiving myself right after I had gotten fired, basically, from hosting my own talk show. And I needed to give myself like a pick-me-up. And I just instinctually one morning raised my hand and high-fived the mirror. And the immediate effect that I felt of the dopamine in my mind and the boost in my mood and this sense of, okay, I got it. I can do this. I can face this. Having my own back, demonstrating it to myself during a really low moment, it was the beginning, that first domino that fell of an entirely new relationship with myself. It's what led me to get into intensive therapy and to start getting serious about my happiness. And I think you know, everything comes back to you and the relationship that you have with yourself. And so we're going to go deep on this because the relationship that you have with yourself is the single most important thing in the world. And in addition to sharing this research and this simple habit with you, I want to unpack some of the things that people experience when they do it. Because I've had so many questions about this, like this one from Teresa. How do I stop beating myself up and forgive myself for my past mistakes? I can't believe how many years you waste beating yourself up for past mistakes. And the reason why we do that is we don't know how to forgive ourselves because we don't know how to accept ourselves. We don't know how to accept the failures, the regrets, the disappointments. We don't know how to accept, we don't know how to love ourselves through it. And that's where, honest to God, this simple habit of demonstrating it every morning in the mirror as part of your morning routine changes everything. And we got to take a short break for our sponsors, but don't you dare go anywhere because I have so much to share with you and I'm going to invite my husband, Chris, to come and join us. Because when I first shared this high five habit thing that I had discovered a couple years ago with him when I first stumbled into doing it for myself, he <laughs> thought it was the stupidest thing he had ever heard. And of course, because I'm relentless and annoying, I was like, but you got to do it for five days. You got to try it. You got to try. And what happened when he tried it for five days 
was both life-changing, profound, and it was heartbreaking for me to hear as a spouse just how much my husband was struggling and how the simple assignment of looking yourself in the eyes was impossible for him to do at that time. Okay. I almost forgot the most important habit that helps with self-love and self-acceptance, and that's the high five habit. All right, I'm going to explain it. The high five habit, super simple. Don't overthink this. I will do an entire episode about the high five habit probably in January because there's so much science to cover and so many stories to tell you. It's also the subject of my New York Times bestselling book called The High Five Habit. But let me just tell you what this habit is because it is the thing you need to know based on science and research to have a breakthrough in self-acceptance and self-love. Here it is. Tomorrow morning, after you finish brushing your teeth, put the toothbrush down and now I want you to do the high five habit, and this is how you do it. First, you look in the mirror. For many of you, that's going to be the hardest part. 50% of men and women, based on our research, cannot or will not look themselves in the mirror because they do not like the person they see. That is sad. And so I don't want you to be surprised if simply looking at yourself in the mirror is really difficult. Step two. You are then going to raise your hand and high five your reflection. I know it sounds dumb. It sounds stupid. Why would somebody do that? I'll tell you why somebody would do that in a later episode because the science will is so profound. The neuroscience, the research on motivation, the research on mindset, the research on how uh, the dopamine gets really, it's just unbelievable what happens when you simply high five yourself in the mirror. I just want you to practice it and trust me on this one. Now, let me tell you what's going to happen. When you go to raise your hand, I don't want you to say anything. Nothing. It's just about the action and watching yourself high-five yourself. The action alone of high-fiving yourself does all the work neurologically, physiologically, chemically, and psychologically. It will take less than five days for you to have a breakthrough in self-love if you simply look in the mirror every morning and send yourself into your day by high-fiving yourself in the mirror. You may laugh. The reason why you laugh is because your brain releases dopamine. This is really normal. You might burst into tears. That's also very normal because you may not have looked at yourself for real or been kind to yourself for real in years. Many, many people are super surprised by how emotional they get by simply silently high-fiving themselves every morning in the mirror. If you have this visceral, that's the stupidest thing, I really want you to do it. Because not being willing to simply try something that I'm telling you, we've had 164,000 people in 91 countries go through a five-day challenge with me called the High Five Challenge. I'll tell you about that in a minute. And the results are just irrefutable. This is the fastest way based on science to start rewiring your brain and to have a breakthrough in being kind and loving to yourself. And it works at a reprogramming level in your nervous system and in your brain. And it's all in the book. But I just want you to trust me on this. And so the best way to do this is let me coach you and support you because I have developed a free, that's right, no money, nothing to buy, free five-day challenge. It's called the High Five Challenge, H-I-G-H, the number five challenge, H-I-G-H, the number five challenge, highfivechallenge.com. Register for free. If you want a true breakthrough in how you speak to yourself, how you feel about yourself, loving yourself, this is the fastest way to do it, and I would love to coach you. So, High Five Challenge, I'll see you in it. All right, Oakley, thank you for letting me do that. Um, let's bring it home. I want to start sort of at the beginning of the spectrum. So, so you receive so many people from around the world every day, and so do I, writing in because they can't find love, mm. because they have a string of relationships that have failed, and they have a story about needing to find love, mm. about I can't find love, about, and I, I, as a mom, having had two daughters who are now in really great relationships, seeing them chase it. <laughs> Seeing them like attach their value around somebody else, picking them, loving them. And I think a lot of people can relate to that. Where do you begin when it comes to building this new skill 
around how you think about love. Mm -hmm. Where would you tell somebody? Is it rule number one? <laughs> it is rule number one in the book, but I think you've just brought out a beautiful point that I want to respond to. And it's that we all have a story that we're writing about love. And the interesting thing is that our mind makes us fiction writers. And we're writing our own fictional version of what our love story looks like. And it changes every single day. One day we feel like anyone would be lucky to have us. But then there's months that go by when we feel we're completely unlovable and we're not enough. And I think it's really interesting because we both know this, that the story you're saying to yourself, the story you're telling yourself naturally becomes your reality because you're looking for the facts. You're looking for those truths in your life. So if you think to yourself, you know, no one's attracted to me right now, you're now going around looking for how many people are not attracted to you and don't look at you. It's almost like when you make a decision to say, I'm thinking about buying this brand of car or I'm thinking about buying this brand of whatever it may be. Now you see that brand everywhere, you hear it everywhere. Right, right. It's not that suddenly everyone just started buying that car on the streets or buying that product or brand, but you see it everywhere because it's at the forefront of your consciousness. And so if the story is, I'm not good enough, I'm not ready, and I'm unlovable, which is a very true and real story of the people that are writing in for us, that unfortunately is what you're going to perpetuate. And that's why rule one is about what you do alone. Because if you're waiting for someone to love you, to believe you're lovable, that means you're saying that the day they change their mind, you're now immediately unlovable. Mm. And so you're deciding whether you're lovable or not based on whether someone else thinks you're worthy of love. And I think that that sets us up for a lot of pain, a lot of stress, a lot of pressure. There's this beautiful thought from Paul Tillich. And he talks about how in the English language, we have two words for being alone, but we only talk about one of them. And that word is loneliness. I'm lonely. I feel alone. It's been a lonely day. It's been a lonely year. I'm experiencing loneliness. Right. But we never use the other word. And the other word is solitude. It's just not used in our vocabulary. And he says that loneliness is the weakness of being alone. And solitude is the glory, or as I say, the strength of being alone. And what I want people to understand is that when you take the time on your own to do three things, the first thing is you have to learn about yourself. You have to learn what you like, what you don't like, what experiences you're into, what you're not into, because what we don't realize is when you start dating someone, you adopt all of their likes and dislikes only in a few years to feel like you don't know who you are anymore right. and you lose yourself. Well, this is going to sound like a dumb question, but I have to ask. It. Yeah. How the hell do you figure out what you like? <laughs> no, I'm not. So, I, I'm yeah, serious. Yeah, like, question. If, if you've yeah. always been somebody. Yeah. So, so let's, let's role play. No, no, no. Let's You're do it. You're my life yeah. coach. Yeah. Okay. My parents are divorced. I have had terrible relationships through high school and college, Jay. And, um, the last person I was with cheated on me. And every time I go out to the bars with my friends, all my friends get approached by people. Mm -hmm. I don't know who I, I like, how yeah. do I find love? Like yes. how to coach me? So, so first mistake, and yes. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say this in a coaching session, but to speed it up for us, first mistake, you're already thinking it's about what do you like about the partner? I'm saying, what do you like about yourself? And where do what you, you start like in your you own don't life? Know so yourself. very simple. When you go out for a dinner, uh -huh. as soon as you get back, you know whether you like the food at that restaurant or not, don't you? Yes. If you went out for a burrito, you know whether you like it or not. If you went out for Italian, you know whether you like it or not. How about we start doing that with people, places, and projects? How about we start reflecting? When we take on a project at work, after we complete it, let's sit there and reflect. Don't reflect while you're doing it, because that can often be misleading. Sometimes a piece of food comes out and it looks awkward or uncomfortable or it's a weird color. Then you try it and it's incredible. So it's only by trying do we know. And so after you finish your project to work, did I like it or not? What did I like about it? What didn't I like about it? Was that my comfort or was that my discomfort? Three questions, really easy. Did I like it or not? What did I like about it or not like about it? And what I didn't like about it, was that just because it was uncomfortable or is it because... I actually found it terrible. 
And if you did that with people, groups you spend time with, so many of us never change our friends over a decade because we never reflected when we left. Mm. You'd never go back to a restaurant if you had a bad experience. That's but true. You, but you keep going back to the same person. Oh my God, we crawl back. We crawl Jay, back. we beg them back in our <laughs> because life. Because we never took that time to reflect because it was always about them. We make it about them. So give me, I'll give you Ooh, a relationship. Okay, so stop. I yes. want to make sure everybody just heard that. <laughs> Skill number one, rule number one, let yourself be alone. But what I want to say is this was the huge paradigm for shift for me. Mm. So much of us are chasing and seeking love. And step one that I just got from you is you got to make it about yourself and not about the other person. Mm -hmm. And until you understand the things you love and the things that make you come alive when you're alone, that's the beginning of this. Yeah, we keep making lists of what we want in someone else, right? We keep making a list of, I want them to be kind. I want them to be tall. I want them. So all of our energy is being pointed outwards rather than saying, who am I becoming? Who am I striving to grow into? What is it that I'm passionate about? When you're focused on all of that, all of a sudden you feel you have so much more to offer in a relationship. You walk into it recognizing that someone would be fortunate to be with you and you'd be fortunate to be with them because you have something to share. I think most of us, we walk into relationships because we're scared of being alone. And when we do that, studies show we do three things. If you're feeling alone, if you're scared of being alone and single and you're going into a relationship because of that fear, research shows three things happen. The first thing is you're guaranteed to settle for less than you deserve, guaranteed. The second thing is you're more likely to be dependent on that person because you think they're out of your league. And so now you'll become, do, mold, fold, become anything they want, they want you to be. Mm. And the third is you're going to be scared to leave them because being with them in your mind is better than being alone. And so you think about all of us who've been in that situation before. And by the way, it's not your fault. Movies have you been have in done that situation this. before? I have been in a situation before many times in my teens yeah. where I sadly, and I regret this, I showed love to people in order for them to validate me. Mm. So it wasn't that I didn't like them, but I showed them more extreme forms of passion and love because I thought they'd say, Jay, that's amazing. You're the best person I've ever been with. I just wanted to hear those words. Yeah. And that comes back from my childhood trauma of being bullied for being overweight, for being bullied for being Indian, for having a group of girls who lined up next to my football match when I was 11 years old shouting, she's out of your league. What? Yeah. So I was, uh, I was 11 years old in primary school or elementary school, as you say in the US. And I was, there was one girl in school that everyone had a crush on, right? You're 11 years old. And there was one girl that every guy had a crush on. And all the guys knew and all the girls knew, but she didn't know we had a crush on her. And one day I came in late from, I think a doctor's appointment or something like that. And everyone was laughing when I came in. And I didn't know what they were laughing about. So I sat down and everyone was giggling at me and pointing at me. And I was thinking, what's going on here? And then one of my friends slipped me a note. And the note, I opened it and it said, she knows. And I was like, she knows what? I realized that all the guys and all the girls had told her that the only person in the class that had a crush on her was me. And I was considered one of the least desirable people in my class because of my weight and the color of my skin. And so for the rest of that week, all the girls bullied me standing behind, literally we're playing football. When I say football, I mean soccer, but right. we're playing football and I was a goalkeeper because that was the only position I'd be allowed to play. And the girls lined up behind the goal and shouted out, she's out of your league. I can't believe you thought you could get her. I can't believe that you thought she could be with you. And I realized that that trauma, that experience transferred over to my teens where now all I wanted was a girl to say, you're the best, you're amazing, you're incredible because of that other statement I'd heard all those years before. You know, it's amazing how we have these experiences and it just blocks our ability to let love in because we don't believe that we're worth it. Yeah. That also, I'm realizing, impacted how you first showed up when mm. you started dating your wife, Roddy. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. can we talk about that? Yeah, because, you know, absolutely. I know that you were 
in business school, when you first heard a monk speak at the age of 18 and you felt the call to become a monk, and did you meet Roddy before you became a monk or how did you guys meet? Yeah. So going back to that, that moment, and then I'll dive into that question. I feel like you spend your life seeking validation. Mm -hmm. You then don't get it in the way you wanted it. And then you finally decide you have to validate yourself. Yes. And that journey can be 10 years, 20 years, or even 50 years. And so the shorter we make that journey, the better it is. I met the monks when I was 18 years old. And I met Radhi just before, six months before I was about to go and become a monk. So my final year of university. And the way we met was I was using the last six months, I would use all my weekends to go to the temple in my local area to train. And to be honest, just to stay out of trouble, because I was like, if I'm at university during my weekends, I'm going to get into trouble. So I need to go and practice. And I was asked to show a lady came in one day. She was around my mom's age. And I was asked to show her around to do some services and some rituals at the temple. I've never been asked to do this before this day. I've never been asked to do it again. And at the end of it, she said to me, she, has, she said, I have a daughter that I'd love to introduce to you. I'd love for her to meet someone who's into spirituality and meditation. She's probably around your age. And I said, well, I'm so sorry. I'm going to go off and become a monk, but I'd introduce her to my sister. So that woman that I'd met happened to be Radhi's mom. And she brought Radhi in to meet me and I introduced her to my sister. And I saw Radhi, I probably exchanged like three words with her. I thought she was stunning and attractive and beautiful. Hence what I was saying about finding her attractive. But in my head, I was like, no, 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 I'm training to be a monk. I need to stay focused. Like, don't worry about it. And so her and my sister became friends. When I came back from the monastery, her and my sister had become really close. Radhi was at my house all the time. My sister was at hers all the time. And then my sister was our, our middle person, who our wing person, who, who helped us get the message across. So we met, we met before and it was four years from, and, and then I found out that her mother that day uh, prayed that her daughter would find someone like me. And I found that out many years later. And now I know she hates me because we moved to LA. So Oh, your mother in law hates me. <laughs> yeah, that you. my mother in law hates me because we moved to LA. So uh, you mentioned though that you made you you've made mistakes yeah, in love. And yeah. I, I want to just connect that yeah. that experience of being bullied as a kid and then feeling like if you just really get somebody to love you back. Mm-hmm then you're going to feel worthy mm -hmm. for how you showed up in the beginning with your now wife. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I realized that I don't, I think another big thing for me was chasing the approval of a male figure. My dad was quite aloof when I was growing up and I've always considered my dad to be more of a friend than a father. Mm. And even till this day, my dad's my friend. I can always talk to him, but it was my mom who taught me how to like shave my beard and like, that's why I have great grooming habits. <laughs> like I was going to say, is that why you still have a beard? Skin. Did she not yeah, do yeah. a good job with no, that? No, yeah, exactly. Kidding. But my mom taught me how to take care of my skin. Like my mom was the one who was teaching me and guiding me through all the things that you'd think a dad would do. And what was really interesting about that is I think the monks became my first male role models. Mm. And I was looking for them to validate me. Now, the interesting thing when you're trying to get validated by monks is they don't validate you. They're just trying to teach you the truth. And so that's when I learned to validate myself during that time. And it was really powerful. But here's the interesting thing. We're conditioned so deeply. Mm. We've watched so many movies. We've listened to so many songs. We've seen so many cliches and examples of what love truly is that we snap back into those habits as soon as we're back. So as soon as I came back from the monastery, and I started dating Radhi around six months later, I snapped back into all my old habits because that's how strong it is. So if anyone ever feels compelled and you keep thinking, I keep dating the same person again and again. I don't yes. know what's wrong with me. Yes, like, what is I, wrong with us, yeah. Jay? <laughs> well, that's the thing. It's that the conditioning of the gifts and gaps that our parents left become the map of how we look for love. So if our parents gave us gifts, we're looking for people who give us those same gifts. Mm. If your parents were present, if they turned up to your dance recital, if they turned up to your soccer game, you now are looking for someone who's forever present, unlikely as an adult. That's not always going to happen. And if your parents left gaps, maybe they didn't believe in you. 
Maybe they criticized you. Maybe they compared you to a sibling or a family member or a cousin. Now you have that gap and you're hoping someone else is going to fill it. And what I learned during my time as a monk was whatever you want from someone else, first give it to yourself. If you're looking for compliments from someone else, give it to yourself first. If you're looking for understanding from someone else, understand yourself first. And if you're looking for validation and affection, do that for yourself first. That's why I love um, your high five habit. Like it's perfect, right? The reason why it works is you're asking everyone to look in the mirror every morning and give themselves exactly what they need from the day. And they can give it to themselves in the mirror. You're high-fiving yourself. Like that is a perfect demonstration of how deeply you believe in this. I'm going to ask Jay to do something in a minute because he's in the middle of explaining rule number two, which is don't ignore your karma. Yeah. Um, and you have this beautiful meditation, but I just want to offer up something mm. to someone who may be listening and feeling like, but, 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 but. One of the most simple exercises you could ever do if you feel like you just can't break through in this area of being in a healthy relationship or, or truly um, finding or attracting love with the right person, just write down on a piece of paper everything you're looking for and then be that person mm -hmm. yourself. Mm -hmm. And something funny happens. You're like actually looking for things that are a void. And if you be those things for yourself, that person starts to show up. Mm -hmm. But Jay has an even deeper tool. You have this younger self meditation. Mm. Would you be willing to just walk us through that meditation for just even a minute of yeah. what that is like? Yeah. Eyes closed? Yeah. Amazing. I love yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. We, I'd love to do that. I think so. For anyone who's doing this, I'm just adding a disclaimer that this can be emotive. It can be challenging. And so please do this when you're in a safe space, when you are uh, feeling more steady and you're feeling uh, at ease. And maybe do it when you can follow it up with a bit of journaling or a bit of moment of reflection and maybe even a conversation with a partner or a friend or, or someone that you trust. And so just to give that before, before we dive in. But I just want everyone to gently and softly close their eyes. And just take a moment to be present with your breath, the seat or bed or floor beneath you. And whatever sounds are in your environment. I want you to visualize yourself meeting your 13-year-old self. Visualize their face. Visualize what you were probably wearing. Visualize yourself at that age, and as you get closer, give them a warm, loving embrace. And now, I want you to share with your younger self everything you wish you heard at that age. Everything you wish you were told, you can give it to them right now. You are enough. You're worthy of love. You have what it takes. Whatever it may be for you. Shower them with all the love that you deserve then and now.
and now ask them what wisdom or insight they have for you. Just listen carefully and if nothing comes up immediately, allow it to arise even after this meditation, tomorrow or this week. What advice or insight or words does your younger self have for you? Once again, give them a warm, loving embrace. All the love, all the connection. And know that that inner child is forever within you. And you can revisit them, shower them with love whenever you like. And when you're ready, you can gently and softly open your eyes and just be present. Thank you. Thank you for beautiful. allowing us that space. I, I literally... Um, do you mind if I share? Please, I'd love to hear if you're, I, um, if you're so willing to. Yeah, I, I, I uh, saw myself standing there with this Dorothy Hamill haircut which was that famous figure <laughs> skater. Uh, let me tell you, the 13-year-old Mel Robbins does not look like the average 13-year-old today. <laughs> that's why I picked that awkward age. Like, no one at 13, I don't think there's anyone who is. Oh, man, and I've got this, like, uh, Benetton sweater on. I don't know why I'm focused I love on it. the clothes. That's but... good. No, it's imp no. that's really good visualization. Like, the more, de I mean, if we had longer, and as I describe in the book, the more detailed, the better. Yes. That's great. That's yes. fantastic, yeah. Was there a moment that you had an epiphany or like what freaking happened? Yeah, I'd love to tell you. Okay. So maybe you should give everybody a little background I will. of Oakley before he I loved will. himself. Okay. So to give context, uh, 13, I feel like you start to become very self-conscious, like 11 and so on. Like 11, like 13 is when it really like 11 to 13 is when it starts. Yep. I think that's when it begins. So I'd say that I started to be a little self-conscious when I was 13. I had very short hair, like so short to the point where it wasn't even curly like it is now. Um, it was blue and red and uh, bleach and pink. And it was every color. It was every color. Why always. was it every color? Because I really wanted to just do that. I woke up one day and I was like, I want that. I want that. And then like a few months later, I was like, oh my God, I don't want this. <laughs> and I couldn't do anything about it because my whole head was literally a different color. So I think that's when I started to be like, oh, like, uh, I don't know. Like, I'm not liking myself right now. And also like, I feel like I was definitely struggling with weight issue. I don't know. I'd look at myself and look at, I was 13. I was 13. It was, it was, it was weird. Yeah. But what would you look in the mirror and see? Chubby cheeks, double chin, man boobs, moobs. <laughs> Get out of the shower and be like, ugh. No. And I was 13. Like, I was so young. You told me a story once yeah, about... Yeah, the, the jeans. Yeah. Yeah. So, seventh grade Oakley, bleached hair, no eyebrows. I didn't have eyebrows. Well, they hadn't... <laughs> they hadn't they grown were there. In. They hadn't, like... But they were really, they really were blonde. They were very blonde. So, it looked like I had no eyebrows. I had blonde hair. Um, And my... For one day, I wore skinny jeans. And I just, like, liked how they felt. Like, I liked the look of skinny jeans on me. So I continue to wear them every single day, every single day. Like I like remember this October to like um, April, and yeah. like you know that first day in April where it like is just warm enough where you can like not have to wear a sweatshirt or like wear shorts for the first time, and you're like, fuck yeah, like winter's over. Yes. And so I'm like, fuck yeah, like winter's over. Like let me throw on a pair of shorts, and I go to school. I'm so excited, and the first like nobody even says good morning. The first thing everybody says is your legs look so weird, and I was like. Like, what? Like, this is the first time I'm ever not wearing, like, jeans and everybody's making fun of my legs. And I'm like, oh, my God. So for the rest of the year, I wore jeans, even in, like, 70 and 80 degree weather, because I was so worried about people being like, your legs look weird. That's so sad. I know. 
because I was just like, oh my God, they think my legs look weird. Like, I don't want to stand out. I don't want them to look at my legs. What was it like that day at school with shorts on, having it was, had somebody it was like, say no, publicly? It was, it was more than one person. More than multiple people said my legs look weird. It was like, I just wanted to find a pair of jeans. I wanted to find a pair of pants anywhere. I would have fucking taken anything. I would have worn, <laughs> I would have worn leggings. Like, I don't care. Give me literally anything other than shorts and I will be fine. But I just like, I didn't even want, it's not that I wanted to leave. I just like wanted to get the attention away from myself and I had no idea what to do or how to do it. So I just kind of like sat there and thought about it all day. And I was like, my legs do look weird. Hmm. And like, it's not even because they were like pinging on me. They, it was just like, they've never seen my legs before. But anyways, so very self-conscious, very like, ooh, continued into eighth grade. Um, and then what happened? Because this sounds terrible. What changed? Yeah, what changed? Well, because I think we can all relate to this where you look in the mirror and you focus like, on what you don't like. Yeah. You have an experience of just wanting the attention to be off you or wanting people to accept you or wanting to fit in. Every single one of us can relate to that gene story, Oakley. And I think we discount how these tiny moments where somebody picks on you or criticizes something about your appearance or your voice or your height or your skin color, how it affects us. It stays with you forever. You know, I can remember as you're talking an incident that happened in my life. It was ninth grade and this movie flash dance was super popular. Jennifer Beals was the star of it. And I was so in love with that movie that I marched right to my mom's hairdresser and asked them to give me a Jennifer Beals perm. Now, to get curly hair like Jennifer Beals, you had to get layers first, and then I got a perm. I walked out of there, and I looked like a labradoodle. Tight curls, wavy, big moppy perm head. I thought it was fantastic. And so the next day, I go to School Oak, and I'm wearing a sweatshirt, of course, with my shoulder exposed because that was the flash dance dance look. I didn't even take dance classes. I had my bouncy, full, new Jennifer Beals poodle perm. And I walked in, and I'll never forget walking down that hall, just like you with the jeans. It wasn't one person that pointed out the perm. It wasn't one person that laughed. It was like everybody in that hallway. And I went home that night, just like you went home and you never wore shorts again. I went home that night and washed my hair about 25 times to try to wash the perm out, which you actually can't do. <laughs> it just makes it frizzier. What happens in those moments is that none of us, when we're kids, have the ability to turn to the people criticizing us and be like, you freaking idiots. My legs are fine. What we do in those moments where we feel separate is we turn against ourselves. And it's those tiny moments that happen over and over and over again where we turn against ourselves and we become obsessed with making other people not pick on us or like us or fitting in. That's where we lose that connection to self. Like, Because when you turn against yourself, it's literally an act of self-hatred. So... What happened next for you? All right. So what happens is eighth grade comes around. Now, would you say at this point you like didn't like yourself or like where were you about there your relationship with Oak? It was very like, I'd say it was like 70, 30. Like myself, 30%. Didn't like myself, 70%. Okay. Uh, but eighth grade, you know, I'm older. I look a little bit older. It was a good year. I'd, I'd say it was a good year. Like I kind of like wore shorts, thankfully. Um, I kind of got over that. I wore shorts. I I kept wearing sweatshirts though. My my the top half of my body was a big like, no thank you because I, <laughs> I like my boobs, my man boobs. They were not it. It was like, oh my god. Okay, this is. But anyways, fascinating. We're getting to the I point. Oh, I never thought you had man boobs. I did. I'd get out of the shower and I'd like take a step and I'd like see him like go big up and jiggle. <laughs> I'd be like, no, dude. You said that you rarely see anyone with chronic anxiety who is not addicted to something yes and that there is a tight connection between anxiety and addictive behavior can you 
explain that and help us to understand sure. that? Sure. So I'm going to mention the E word here. I hope you don't shut off. Ego? It. I won't even understand it. Can well, you explain well, it without well, the ego? The What's that? Your ego is kind of like an overprotective mother. Right? Okay. Like it doesn't want you to go and play on the swings because you might fall off. It doesn't want you to talk in front of people because when you did that, when you were in grade six, people laughed at you. And is you the worked. ego the same thing as the alarm? It's related to it through the amygdala as well. See, I'm already confused. Yeah, I know. So I'm not going to get into too much neuroscience. But basically, okay. your, ego, your ego is hooked into the amygdala and your amygdala says, we're never doing that again because that hurt us. You know, whatever it was. And, and the amygdala never forgets. So it's basically getting into that, that getting bypassing that ego because the ego is so overprotective that it will not let you go back into your old alarm. So the ego is thinking. Yeah, more or less. Yeah, it, it, it is something that, that, that it talks to us with thinking. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, but let's talk about the connection between anxiety okay. and addiction. Okay. So basically, we need, we need something to help us through this, this, is this alarm. Wait a yeah. minute. I think I just got it. Hold on. Okay, let, me, okay. let me see if this okay. is the answer. You ready? No. Is addiction typically somebody's coping mechanism for the alarm? So, for example, you reach for alcohol because it drowns out the alarm. You reach for porn or drugs or stress or whatever Overwork. because it... Achievement. Yes. Got it. Okay. I got it. So, if somebody is struggling with addictive behavior, whether it is alcohol or cigarettes or vaping, or it is any of that stuff, you are more than likely not addressing the root issue, which is the anxiety and alarm that's continuing to go off in the background. Yeah, and on top of that, wow. basically, the ego is very powerful. It doesn't want to let you go back into that. So the only way that you can feel love, connection, whatever, is alcohol, <clears throat> is codeine, is cocaine, whatever you're addicted to. So, so wait, but you feel yeah. the connection to the alcohol or the codeine. That's what you're saying. Like, like so so this is why I get confused with the ego because sure. I'm like, I don't give a shit about the ego. Let's sure. start, like the, the alarm. And then what makes sense to me is that addiction mutes the alarm. Totally. And that the you become bonded and connected to, for me, it was stress. For my husband, it was a daily weed habit. You yeah. know, like for what that, and, and that addiction is what's muting the alarm. This yeah. is really cool. Yeah. So where does mindset come in? Because, you know, you, you, there is so much out there about mindset and mental wellness and, and it's interesting because this conversation with you makes me desperate for a different word than mental health. Because sure. even the word mental health makes me go neck up, makes me yeah. think thoughts, makes me go to just what's going on in my mind. And what you've taught me today is a game changer because what you've taught us all is that no, 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 all mental health issues start in the body and they start with this kind of reaction that happens in your body to stored trauma or to a threat or to uncertainty. And then that signals our minds and our minds then start spinning thoughts. And if we don't address this alarm system in our body, which has a purpose, which is there to protect us, which is supposed to agitate you, but we exacerbate it. We try to mute it. If we don't learn how to turn inward and heal all of this in our body and turn toward this alarm and soothe ourselves and love ourselves and give ourselves the reassurance and the support or whatever it is that we didn't get in childhood or what we need in that moment, that that's, that is actually the beginning of all healing. That's what I'm getting from you. Yeah. And that's exactly what it is. So I would. Why do we call it mental health then? Like, what isn't there? Can we come up with a different word that would actually signal you that when you're struggling with depression or you're struggling with anxiety or you're struggling with any like addiction issues, that it's not a mental health issue, 
it is a body something. Like, I don't even know how to describe this well, because it's, it's the exact system. opposite of the way that we think about things right yeah, now. It is the opposite. And, it, and you know, I, I'd love, you know, to come up with a better term than body set. But I think body that's set. What is that? That feels like weightlifting. Well, no. Well, it's it's like mindset, body set. Like, oh, what is what is mindset, the place in your body? Yeah. Can you can you regulate your body? Because if you regulate your body, your mind will get regulated. If you regulate your mind, your body might get regulated. So what I'm saying is that if you go in through the body, your body is much more likely to to relax your mind than your mind is to relax your body. Because you can say, hey, relax. Oh, hey, whoa, down. whoa, whoa. Did you guys hear that? That was a wake up call for me right there. You were just dropping freaking knowledge, Russ. Okay, hold on. I'm going to state this again. I, 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 And now I have menopause brain. And so I've just forgotten what I said. You said something like your body, if you regulate your body, it will yeah. regulate your mind. But it's if you regulate your mind, right, it'll, you, you say it because you're, you're the one who said it. Yeah, it's much more effective to regulate your body first, which will automatically regulate your mind, than to try and regulate your mind to to regulate your body. Because your your mind lies to you all the time. Your body never can. Is this why exercising is such an effective thing to do Partly. when it comes to anxiety and focus? Partly. But there is there's something beyond uh, exercise. There's there's something within the somatosensory cortex, the, or the the part of the brain that controls our our movement and our sensation. When we activate that, we start getting into the sense of the body and out of the the rumination of the mind. And so, so by activating the, that, is that what you're saying? You can activate that part by doing the exercises you've already talked about in terms of locating where the alarm is and then finding a neutral part yeah. in your body breathing into it and just you movement all... you know just that's why yoga is so that's why yoga is so effective because it brings you into your body you know anxiety at, it, at its root is really a mind body disconnect right we go up into our heads and we stay in our heads because we don't want to go down in our body because that's where that's where the pain is so we don't want to go into feeling town down in our body we want to stay up in our thoughts and that's another addiction so we get addicted to worry and and that's and that's why it, it's so hard to treat anxiety just by trying to fix thoughts because we're addicted to thinking already. We don't need any more thinking. We need a lot more feeling, but we don't want to feel because that's where the freaking pain is. Wow. So I've gotten a couple huge things okay. from this. Um, that first of all, all anxiety results from a separation. Of some anxiety kind. that has some kind of separation experience or feeling separate from other in childhood and self. and self and self. But what you just said too was really interesting, which is our response to that alarm or that feeling of being separate from self or separate from others or attacked by others or whatever is that we actually do separate from ourselves. Anxiety and the alarm system, the way that most of us respond to it is to separate from our bodies, go up in our heads. And the way to quiet the alarm and ultimately turn it off is to come back and join in with yourself and come back to where the alarm is sounding off in your body and then find a neutral or safe space in your body where you can draw your attention and breathe into back and forth and back and forth. And that when you quiet the alarm, and when you go toward it and soothe your own body, that is the step that you need to take if you want to heal this. And that the thinking is part of the toolkit. Like what would you recommend as, a, as, as some sentence that we could say, if we're trying the tools, we go into our body, we're soothing ourselves. Is there something that people could say or repeat to themselves that you find is effective with the more neck down approach? Absolutely. So what, what do you say? Basically this, am I safe in this moment? Am I safe in this moment? I know I've got a presentation to do on Friday. I know I've got a big tax bill. I don't know how I'm going to pay for it. My mom is sick, but am I safe in this moment? Why a question? Because I like saying, I am safe. You can do I it both. You am can do okay. It both ways. 
I find that people with anxiety, though, this is the thing about saying I love you in the mirror is that people don't allow that in. The reason why you're anxious in the first place is because you block love. So when you say I love whoa, you. Whoa, 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 whoa. The yeah. reason why you're anxious is because you block love? For yourself, yes. What? You're separated from yourself. That's exactly what it comes down to. That's what anxiety or alarm really is. It's a separation. And this is what I do. This is my little, we didn't get into my little intuitive thing here. We're but... going to in a minute. Hold on. Okay. We're, we're gonna, we save the best for last, but hold on. I got, okay. Keep talking about the fact that when you have this alarm going off, yeah. you are blocking like, just say it again. I, 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 I like I'm processing, hyper processing now. I'm just like, oh my God, I think I got it. I think I got it. I think I got it. That literally your alarm is asking for love and reinsurance. Absolutely. And when you go into your head, you block yourself from receiving it. Yes. When you and go you into your body child. and you breathe into the alarm and soothe yourself, you are actually giving yourself love. Yes. Holy shit. And a lot of people with anxiety... Just they're, they're uncomfortable with love in the first place. I'll give you a very quick example from my own life. So my dad, before I was 10 years old, was this wonderful guy. Like he was so, uh, you know, connected to me and nurturing, taught me how to hit a ball, play chess, all this kind of stuff. Very, very connected to him. And I loved him greatly. And then as I got to be a young teen and his schizophrenia got worse and worse and worse and it became suicidal and a bunch of other things, I withdrew from him because to see him in, in, in horrible depression was just too painful for me. So I blocked my love for him because it was just too painful to feel it. And that you can't block love from a parent without blocking love on some level to everyone. So there's a reason why I've been married three times. So, so this is one of the things. So when you find the blocks that you have to loving yourself, this is how you heal. And this is basically my little intuitive gift is I can tell people where their blocks are to loving themselves. And then when you remove those blocks, the anxiety, the alarm just kind of fades away. So this is, this is really going at the root cause protocol as opposed to just trying to make you think better. Wow. So how do you help people find that place where they've blocked love? Well, I go through their body, you know, like what I believe the short version of what I believe happens to you is as a child, you experience an overwhelming stress. It's too much for your conscious mind to handle. So you stuff it down. Freud would call it repression. You stuff it into the unconscious and the body keeps the score, just like Bessel van der Kolk says. So because the body is a representation of the unconscious mind and the unconscious mind is where these old, you know, damaging programs are stored, they'll show up in the body. So I will find in your body where you feel that alarm and reverse engineer it to get into the same room with those unconscious programs and then I can change them. Wow. That's pretty cool. I think um, my biggest takeaway, and I keep saying this because clearly every 10 minutes I have a life-changing takeaway from this conversation, but my biggest takeaway is the connection between the alarm that goes off and the love that you're not allowing yourself to receive. Totally. And that it's beautiful to think that loving yourself is the way you cure anxiety. And what a beautiful thing. And I, it reminds me of something um, pretty amazing that my son Oakley shared with me. Um, I said to him the other day, I was like, dude, you know, one of the things I love about you is that you, more than almost anybody I have ever met, are just so comfortable with yourself. Like you really seem to like yourself. And now, you know, I should preface this by saying that, you know, this is a kid that really struggled. Three different schools before he was done with eighth grade, severe dyslexia, got so severely bullied at a camp that we had to pull him out of it. And the director wrote a long letter apologizing for everything. Like it was... This kid has been through the ringer. Mm. And he said to me, well, mom, he said, I realized just, and he said, this happened during quarantine. During quarantine, when I got to hang out with you and dad and, you know, my two older sisters, all four people who love me, I just started to realize just because other people pick on me or hate me doesn't mean I have to hate myself. Like I could actually just, like myself, like I could 
really just allow myself to love myself. And I got to be honest with you, from that moment, I, I can really almost pinpoint that during the pandemic, like this kid's chronic anxiety was gone. He developed this very positive attitude and it all began from this insight around, hey, if the world is not giving me the acceptance and the love that we all are seeking, maybe I can just give it to myself. Yeah. It's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. I never thought about meeting the alarm of anxiety with acts of self-love. Yeah, and that's, you know, it's counterintuitive on some level because when you're anxious, you don't feel loving. You know, basically your social engagement system is shut off. You're in survival mode. So when you're in survival mode and survival physiology, you go into the emotional part of your brain, which is, you know, evolutionarily programmed to look for threat. And if there's no threat in your environment, if you're just lying there in bed with your, your the sheets up to your neck, you will find threat because you can make it with your big prefrontal cortex. You can make worries. Well, not anymore, because we now know that the second you feel the alarm go off, five, five four, four, three, two, three, one, two, one you do there. not go upstairs, you there. go downstairs. Yep. You go downstairs. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for being here. If you enjoyed that video, by God, please subscribe because I don't want you to miss a thing. Thank you so much for being here. We've got so much amazing stuff coming. Thank you so much for sending this stuff to your friends and your family. I love you. We create these videos for you. So make sure you subscribe. Mwah.